Richard Dawkins started writing The Selfish Gene back in 1972 almost as an afterthought. He admits that at the time, he was deep into laboratory research, so he didn't have a lot of time to write down his ideas. However, due to persistent power outages caused by industrial strife, Dawkins decided to start writing instead of staying in the laboratory, where he kept on getting interrupted by the power blackouts. Unfortunately, after writing only two chapters, the power blackouts stopped, so he shelved the book project and returned to his lab work. He finished the book only after getting a sabbatical in 1975. The book was eventually published a year later. Up to this day, the selfish gene remains as one of the most popular and most influential of Dawkins' books. It's the book that turned Dawkins into a public figure. He currently plays the role of a science advocate along the ranks of Bill Nye, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and E.O. Wilson. What makes the selfish gene popular and effective is its clear and jargon-free approach in explaining complex evolutionary principles. In the scientific community, it's considered as one of the most influential science books ever published during the last 50 years. Why are people? Living organisms have been existing on Earth for millions of years before a young scientist named Charles Darwin posited his revolutionary theory of evolution. Although there were people before him who had an inkling about how evolution works, it was Darwin who put it in a clear working account of how life on Earth came to be. There's no longer a need for us to resort to superstitious belief in finding answers to questions about the source and the meaning of life. According to the author, his primary purpose in writing this book is to put under a microscope the biological aspects of altruism and selfishness as they relate to the theory of evolution. He adds that learning about the evolutionary theory is of great human importance since it affects almost every aspect of our lives. It affects our social activities like loving, hating, fighting, cooperating, giving, stealing, etc., Dawkins' main argument in the book is that all animals on Earth, and that includes us, are machines developed, nurtured, and created through millions of years by our genes. Our genes were able to survive for millennia even under very dire circumstances. As a result of this, Dawkins posits that we should at least expect unique qualities in our genes, a particular quality that we must expect from what is considered a successful gene is ruthless selfishness. This is a gene that nurtures selfishness in individual behavior. However, there are a range of instances wherein these selfish goals can only be achieved through the assistance of individual altruism. Dawkins also makes the bold assertion that welfare of the species as a whole and universal love don't make any sense at all on evolutionary terms. However, Dawkins is quick to point out that he is not advocating a type of morality based on evolution. He's simply attempting to explain how life on Earth evolved. He's not saying that we should morally behave in a certain manner. He presents what he calls the law of universal ruthless selfishness. He believes that this is the driving force behind the survival of our genes and that we should spend the time to understand it and learn how it affects our lives both in the present and in the future. Dawkins adds that we as humans should attempt to understand these selfish genes so that we can develop ways on how to change their course. This isn't impossible to do because the traits we inherit through our genes are not necessarily fixed and unchangeable. Dawkins defines selfishness and altruism as behavioral and not at all subjective. This is because he doesn't want to concern himself with what he terms as a psychology of motives. His main focus is finding answers on whether a type of behavior decreases or increases the survival prospects of both the person performing altruism and the person benefiting from the act. Apparently, acts of altruism are actually acts of selfishness disguised as altruism. It's yet another survival strategy of organisms and the genes within organisms. To prove some of his points, Dawkins discusses a couple examples of selfish and altruistic behavior in other species of animals. These examples are as follows. 1. Black-headed seagulls are social birds, so they move, forage, and nest in huge colonies. During nesting season, nests are often a few feet away from each other. The gulls have a habit of eating the newly hatched chicks of other gulls. For example, a parent goal would patiently wait for the moment when another parent goal turns its back and leaves its nest for a second. 
The goal would then quickly swallow and eat the newly hatched chick of the distracted parent goal. This provides the goal with a nutritious meal without having to leave its nest unprotected. 2. Female praying mantises are well known for their bizarre habit of engaging in cannibalism. Mantises are natural predators in the insect world. Their meals are composed of smaller insects. During a mating ritual, a male mantis creeps behind a female mantis and mounts its back, and they have sexual intercourse. This is where it gets rather macabre. After copulation, the female mantis would usually attack the male mantis, bite its head off, and start eating it. Dawkins concludes that the sexual intercourse is merely an added benefit in the ritual. He adds that the primary goal of the female mantis is to find a good and nutritious meal. Sex is just an added bonus. 3. The majestic emperor penguins that live on the outskirts of Antarctica have a system of finding if there's a predator in the sea before they dive in. These predators are usually seals and sea lions. The penguins would stand on the high rocks or on the brink of the water waiting for one of them to dive in. If one dives in, then the other penguins would immediately know if there's a seal around. Of course, nobody wants to be the one to dive in, so the penguins usually just wait. In some instances, the penguins would start pushing at each other to force one of them to jump into the dangerous waters. 4. Worker bees employ a variety of tactics in protecting their hive and the valuable honey it contains. One of these tactics involve attacking thieves by stinging them. However, this is a huge sacrifice because in stinging the thieves, they are also giving up their lives. During the act of stinging, important organs in the belly of a worker bee get torn out. The bee will soon die. Dawkins describes these altruistic bees as kamikaze fighters. They are saving the hive's food supply, but they won't be around to enjoy the benefits. 5. Many species of birds have a type of alarm call, which they use when they spot a predator bird, such as a hawk or an eagle. When a bird sees a predator, it sounds the alarm call, which prompts the flock to fly off into safer regions. The bird that makes the alarm call is in special danger because the predator now knows where it is. This is altruistic behavior because the bird placed itself in harm's way to protect the other members of the flock. 6. Some species of ground-nesting birds often play weak and injured just to lure away predators from their nests. This performance is called a distraction display. When a predator like a fox approaches a nest, a parent bird immediately limps away from the nest pretending to be weak, old, and injured. Thinking that the bird is an easy meal, the fox quickly follows it. However, just as soon as the fox tries to catch or gobble the bird, the bird would instantly fly away. This is yet another example of altruistic behavior in animals. The parent bird saved the lives of its chick by putting itself in huge danger. Dawkins says that these examples of selfish and altruistic behavior can be clearly explained using the fundamental law he termed gene selfishness. Nevertheless, he explains that he has a different definition for altruism. According to him, the idea that living organisms evolve for the good of the species is a big misconception. He offers an alternative concept, which he calls individual selection. Adherents of the alternative concept are called individual selectionists. In individual selection, selfish individuals tend to survive and prosper in the short term at the expense of the individual altruists. It's the complete opposite of the group selection idea. The group selection idea is flawed on many levels. According to Dawkins, group selection contravenes the Darwinian theory of evolution. He points out that the popularity of the group selection theory is partly due to the fact that it's often in tune with the political and moral ideas that most people in the world share. People tend to go with their idealistic moments instead of looking at what's actually happening among groups of living organisms. Dawkins also criticizes the works of authors like Ardry, who are huge proponents of the group selection theory. The Replicators So far, the most feasible answer to the question of how we got to exist is Charles Darwin's theory of evolution through natural selection. Dawkins describes the theory as satisfying because it shows an explanation of how simplicity developed into complexity. How did unordered atoms group themselves for millions of years to eventually manufacture humans? This deep problem of our existence can be explained by evolutionary theory. 
However, Dawkins says that the legendary scientist term survival of the fittest should be survival of the stable. Everything that we see around us, like the stars, the galaxies, the mountains, the rivers, the flowers, and the waves at the sea, are all stable patterns of atoms. This is why Dawkins uses the phrase, survival of the stable. Dawkins illustrates this stability by pointing out how atoms link up together to create molecules through chemical reactions. A good example of a molecule developed from the linking of atoms is the hemoglobin in our blood. It's composed of chains of stable amino acids, smaller molecules, and atoms that are arranged in very precise formations. The hemoglobin in our blood is a good illustration of the principle that atoms or groups of atoms tend to form themselves in stable patterns. The point that Dawkins was trying to make here is that it's not that hard to grasp the reality that at some point in time, complex molecules evolved through simple processes of chemistry and physics. It's not necessary to think that things happened due to some higher purpose. The accounts of the origin of life in the scientific world are necessarily speculative for the simple fact that nobody was around at that time to see simple molecules develop into complete breathing organisms. Dawkins reiterates this fact before he presents a quick overview of how the earliest stages of life probably developed in the earlier days of the universe. It's difficult to know which chemical raw materials were present on Earth before the formation of living organisms. But there's a good possibility that ammonia, methane, carbon dioxide, and water were abundant during that time. Chemists and physicists have tried to imitate what the young Earth was composed of by combining these compounds into isolated flasks. Something interesting would usually happen inside the flask. They changed colors. They changed their compositions. In short, Molecules that are more complex than the ones put in emerged from the flasks. This provides a good working idea of what maybe happened during the early days of the Earth. These processes gave rise to what is often referred to as the primeval soup. In the primeval soup, some unique molecules were formed by sheer luck or accident. Dawkins calls these unique molecules replicators. A replicator may not be the most sophisticated nor the largest molecule, but it has the ability to create copies of itself. These replicators then attract building block molecules that attract themselves to the replicators. The replicators then spread copies of themselves in the primeval soup. As this goes on, there will be mistakes or errors made. The anomalies end up creating different kinds of replicators and molecules. Soon enough, the primeval soup is rife with several varieties of self-propagating molecules. Keep in mind that All of these descended from a single replicator. Some molecules create copies of themselves faster than other molecules. This is called the speed of replication or fecundity. This means that some molecules will be outnumbered. Some molecules will also live much longer than the others. The primeval soup is soon populated with stable variations of molecules and replicators. However, the primeval soup doesn't have the capabilities to support an infinite number of replicator molecules. First of all, the size of the Earth is quite small and finite. As the replicator molecules increased in numbers, the atom building blocks around them became more and more scarce. The competition intensified, which gave rise to the evolution of more complicated molecules. For millions of years, these replicators evolved to what they are today, genes. Immortal coils. Dawkins refers to living organisms as survival machines for genes. For example, monkeys are survival machines for genes up in the trees, and fishes are survival machines for genes in the water. However, the author puts forth the argument that the genes as we know today may be totally different from the replicator molecules they've come from. He agrees with the suggestion that the very first replicator molecules may not have even been organic molecules, but inorganic crystals and minerals. A DNA molecule is composed of a long chain of building blocks called nucleotides. It's often referred to as the double helix because of the nucleotide chains that twist together around the spiral. Essentially speaking, our DNA is a repository of instructions of how our bodies are made. Think of it as an extensive library that contains the architect's plans for the composition of our bodies. A DNA molecule performs two very important tasks. One, it replicates and makes copies of itself. 
It has been performing this task ever since the universe began. Two, it indirectly supervises the manufacturing process that creates protein molecules. An example of a protein molecule is the hemoglobin. Making proteins is among the first steps in creating living organisms. The plans in creating a living human are spelled out in 46 volumes of chromosomes. There are, in fact, 26 pairs of chromosomes that are filed deep in the nucleus of every cell. Basically, when you were born, you get 23 pairs of chromosomes from your father and another 23 pairs of chromosomes from your mother. These are doled out to us during conception, and there's basically nothing that we can do about it. The transfer of genes happens through two types of cells division. One, there's mitosis, which is the normal division of a single cell into two cells. Then there's meiosis. This form of cell division only occurs during the production of sex cells. Sperms and eggs are made of sex cells. They are quite unique among all the cells in the human body because they only contain 23 chromosomes. All other cells in the body have 46 chromosomes. This is, of course, convenient because the 23 chromosomes from a sperm and the other 23 chromosomes from an egg combine during conception to complete 46 chromosomes. Dawkins uses the word gene to refer to a genetic unit that is tiny enough to last for long generations and to be distributed around in the form of many exact copies. The author explains this by positing that the more likely that a chromosome is separated through the crossing over or mutation, the less it qualifies to be referred to as a gene. In general, natural selection is the differential survival of organisms and other entities. Some species survive for millennia, while others die out even in just the span of a few generations. Those who survive are the ones who are able to efficiently form lots of copies of themselves while going through beneficial mutations. What makes genes very tough to disappear is the fact that they don't grow senile. They leap and transfer from body to body through multiple generations. Dawkins thus describes genes as immortals. Their lifespans should be measured not in years or decades, but in thousands of millions of years. It's this potential for immortality that makes a gene the best candidate as the most basic unit of evolution through natural selection. If genes are nearly immortal, how come we all die of old age? This is a complex question, and there are a few theories attempting to answer it. One theory states that genes suffer damage during an individual's lifetime because of an accumulation of deleterious copying mistakes. Another theory postulates that the gene decay is simply a byproduct of the effects of semi-lethal genes and late-acting genes. This theory has been attributed to Peter Metawar. One unique aspect of this theory is that it doesn't make any prior assumptions about sexual reproduction. Dawkins concludes this chapter with a statement that the gene pool is merely a brand new version of the old primeval soup where genes made their living. Nowadays, genes cooperate with groups from the gene pool to build survival machines. Those survival machines are us. The Gene Machine In the early days of evolution, survival machines were merely receptacles where genes walled themselves up to protect from the chaos happening outside. However, things drastically changed when the organic food in the primeval soup started to dwindle. Two branches of survival methods occurred during this huge upheaval. One, plants began using sunlight to build even more complex molecules. Two, animals learned how to take advantage of the new developments by either eating plants or other animals. These new branches of survival machines found ingenious strategies to stay alive and to keep reproducing. Both plants and animals evolved into multi-celled organisms through millions of years of changes and mutations. However, there's enough evidence to show that natural selection has greatly favored those genes that have the capability to cooperate with other genes. Survival machines then developed behaviors like rapid movement through evolved muscles. This has been largely exploited by animals and to some extent in plants. The way animals timed their movements is a marvel of evolution. This is possible because of neurons or nerve cells, which are the basic units of organic and biological computers. For instance, there are millions of neurons on the human brain that help control our movements and decisions. On the other hand, plants have no need of neurons because they don't need to move around. A neuron is simply a cell. 
Just like any cell, it has its own nucleus and chromosomes. The brains in survival machines utilize these neurons as the instructors in controlling and coordinating the contractions of muscles in the body. It's for this reason that natural selection usually favored animals that were equipped with powerful sense organs. Sense organs communicate directly with muscles and help in telling them what to do or how to react to certain stimuli. Everything is performed with a sense of purpose, and part of that purpose is to preserve genes. Dawkins explains this purposive behavior using the Watt steam governor as an example. This is a reiteration of a purpose machine, a machine that acts as if it has a conscious purpose. Another modern example of a purpose machine is a computer designed to be able to play a game of chess. Dawkins briefly explains these examples, how they work, how they were programmed, and how they relate to evolution. Just like a computer programmer controlling a purpose machine, genes are also control the behavior of their survival machines. The genes don't do this directly because they simply sit passively inside their survival machines. To explain the passivity of genes, Dawkins uses as an example a short science fiction story by Fred Hoyle and John Elliott called A for Andromeda. If there's a civilization 200 light years away that wants to spread its culture to the rest of the universe, it will be almost impossible to do so because of time lag problems. Even if there's direct communication between the sentient beings in Andromeda and the human beings on Earth, the time lag is so huge that the transfer of culture will be almost impractical. Prediction is almost a gambling game in a very complex world. Whenever a survival machine makes a decision, it's basically doing some form of gambling. This is where genes play a very important role. It's the responsibility of genes to program brains, so that will be more effective in making decisions that benefit the survival machine. We have to believe that our genes are helping us build brains that tend to gamble correctly. Of course, the ultimate goal of this is to improve our survival as well as to further propagate the genes in question. Dawkins takes the metaphor of gambling further by considering the stakes, odds, and prizes in the evolution of genes. With these considerations in mind, genes resort to coming up with their own prediction systems. Genes try to improve their prediction abilities by building a capacity for learning. For instance, genes help in predicting if a piece of food is going to be bitter, if an activity is going to be painful, or if another animal is going to be dangerous. Some of these predictive and learning strategies have been implemented in applications like chess playing computer games. To come up with these interactive games, a lot of simulation processes need to be done. However, Dawkins says that the ability to simulate has given rise to subjective consciousness. This, to him, is one of the most mind-boggling puzzles in modern biology. You might be wondering, what does all of this have to do with the concepts of selfishness and altruism? Well, the author says he's simply building up the idea that the behavior of organisms is being controlled by genes in an indirect sense. It doesn't matter if it's altruistic or selfish behavior. These analogies using computers and human decision-making processes are very helpful in understanding the roles that genes played in evolution. It's necessary to look at genes as master programmers who are constantly programming their own selves for propagation and survival. We judge how good they are at their jobs by looking at the success rates of their programs. Are they effective in coming up with coping mechanisms that help survival machines face and overcome real-world problems? Aggression, Stability, and the Selfish Machine Aggression is a necessary component of evolution through natural selection. In the eyes of a survival machine, other survival machines pose a threat to its existence. These others are organisms that might get in its way or organisms that it can exploit for its own benefits. Naturally, when the survival machine is provoked or attacked, more than likely it will hit back. This is simply an indirect attempt to preserve its genes. It's no secret that genes that can control their survival machines and make them act accordingly are greatly favored by natural selection. Aggression among survival machines is also often caused by conflicts with animals in the same species or with animals from another species. These conflicts could be due to territorial disputes, competition for common prey, or the absence of prey altogether. 
The aggression caused by these conflicts sometimes leads survival machines to murder their rivals or even eat them. However, this aggression has its cost as well as its benefits. Killing off a rival can either be beneficial or harmful to a survival machine. To explain aggression mechanisms in animals, Dawkins borrows the ideas of a certain Maynard Smith. Smith has introduced what he termed as the Evolutionary Stable Strategy, ESS. This is nothing more than what's called a pre-programmed behavior policy. An illustration of this strategy is the fight-or-flee response of certain animals. Let's say an animal tries to attack a rival. The animal's pre-programmed behavior pursues the rival if it tries to flee. However, if the rival fights back, then the attacker backs down and runs away. This is a very common behavior in the animal world, especially among predators and prey. An important feature of the evolutionary stable strategy is that it can't be instantly improved by an alternative strategy. This is mainly because the strategy has evolved for millions of years. Dawkins drives the point by stating that a strategy once evolved can't be bettered by a deviant strategy machine. The evolutionary stable strategy is best explained using another hypothetical case by Maynard Smith. This time, it's the hypothetical strategy among hawks and doves. There's the presence of symmetric contest in these strategies. There are also three main sorts of asymmetry in the hypothetical cases. One, individuals may differ in the size of their fighting equipment. Two, individuals may differ in the benefits they reap in the cases that they win. Three, it is a rather weird consequence of the theory that an arbitrary asymmetry can give rise to an evolutionary stable strategy, ESS. However, Dawkins quickly points out that truly arbitrary asymmetries probably don't exist in the real world. Dawkins also suggests that there will come a time when we realize that the invention of the evolutionary stable strategy concept is one of the most important discoveries in trying to explain the theory of evolution by natural selection. The concept is everywhere because it's applicable whenever we find some sort of conflict of interest among living organisms. The concept clearly explains how a group of independent and selfish organisms can come to resemble a single organized whole. Dawkins goes as far as to assert that the ESS concept is going to revolutionize the sciences of ecology and biology in the long run. Genemanship the selfish gene is a single physical bit of DNA that is distributed throughout the living world. It's trying to efficiently replicate itself in the gene pool by assisting to program the body it finds itself in. It's also quite possible that a selfish gene can help replicate itself that are living and located in other organisms or bodies. In the surface, this looks like a classic example of individual altruism, but it's actually brought about by gene selfishness. Dawkins illustrates the idea with the gene for being an albino man. The albino gene is distributed in a lot of individuals. In theory, it's possible that the albino gene helps ensure its survival by programming its host to treat other albino bodies altruistically. The albino gene can also become content if an albino body dies, provided that the death of the body helps other albino bodies survive and prosper. This raises the question, are albinos expected to always act altruistically toward each other? According to Dawkins, the most viable answer is probably no. However, there are quite plausible ways in which genes might recognize their copies in other survival machines. This idea has been promulgated by the likes of W.D. Hamilton, J.B.S. Haldane, and R.A. Fisher. Hamilton in particular has written two papers in the 1960s about such topics. Genes for kin altruism are further discussed by Dawkins, saying that there are levels on how genes treat their survival machines altruistically. For example, a gene for saving five cousins in an almost suicidal manner will not prosper in the gene pool compared to a gene for saving five brothers or ten first cousins. For a suicidal altruistic gene to be successful, it must meet the minimum requirements of saving more than two siblings or more than four half-brothers and sisters. Although the theory of kin selection among genes has a lot of criticisms, Dawkins is adamant that it's true given the numerous examples of it in the world. He states that parental care and child protection acts in the animal world are all fine examples of the kin selection principle. These include acts associated with milk-secreting glands, bodily organs, and pouches, among others. 
family planning. Dawkins makes a distinction between caring for existing individuals and bringing new individuals into the world. He calls these two functions child caring and child bearing. In its lifespan, a survival machine will often make either bearing decisions or caring decisions. According to Dawkins, these decisions can be considered as evolutionary, stable, depending on the state of the species. However, a purely caring strategy can't be considered as evolutionary, stable, because it can be disastrous to the species. A purely caring strategy gives rise to invasions by mutant individuals. In a nutshell, caring can only be described as evolutionarily stable as long as it's mixed with doses of bearing strategies. Parental care is a perfect example of kin selection in the living world. Its evolutionary advantages have been too obvious even before Charles Darwin formulated his famous theory. Those organisms that have survived and successfully evolved for millions of years are those who tend to be great bearers and carers. The decision to bear a new individual is followed by the decision to care for it and ensure its survival. However, caring and bearing always go together, so many people often confuse one with the other, despite the pretty obvious distinctions. The topic even gets more complicated once we look at bearing and caring strategies in the perspective of selfish genes. Dawkins tackles the group selection theory that was popularized by Wynn Edwards. Wynn Edwards suggests that organisms go as far as to deliberately reduce their birth rates for the benefit of the group as a whole. Dawkins counters saying that this is not necessarily true. It's flawed because Wynn Edwards came up with his conclusions in the context of a theory of population regulation. According to Dawkins, the ideas of Wynn Edwards distance themselves from orthodox evolutionary theorists. Wynn Edwards thinks that there are ways in which genuine altruistic birth control can evolve. Dawkins criticizes the writings of Wynn Edwards by pointing out something that isn't often emphasized in the writings. This is the immense body of agreed-upon facts that are not in dispute against each other. For example, it's an established fact that wild animal populations do not really increase at the astronomical rates of which they are theoretically capable. In some instances, these populations stay stable with the rates of births and death keeping up with each other. Then there are the animal populations that fluctuate widely like in the case of lemmings. The populations of lemmings often explode and then crash with the scenario going in cycles. Sometimes in certain locations, the lemming population gets totally wiped out due to extinction. An important truth that needs to be understood is the fact that wild animals almost never die of old age. Most of them perish due to disease, starvation, and predators. Only a few of them really grow old to the point of becoming senile. There are two main theories trying to explain the existence of birth control among animals. One theory posits that it's ultimately altruistic because it's practiced for the good of a group as a whole. The other theory posits that it's selfish because it's practiced for the good of the individual doing the act of reproducing. The first theory is the one being promulgated by Wynne Edwards. It supposes that animals consciously bear less offspring because the act is going to benefit the whole group. Wynne Edwards further states that animals who restrain their birth rates are less likely to get wiped out by extinction compared to animals that reproduce so quick that they endanger their own supply of food. The second theory is the one being promulgated by Richard Dawkins himself. Dawkins credits the famous ecologist David Lack as the chief architect of the selfish gene theory of reproductive planning among animals. Although Lack worked most exclusively with wild birds in trying to understand the theory, the theory can be generally applied to all organisms. Basically, the theory asserts that animals tend to make the optimum number of offspring because of their own selfish point of view. Dawkins concludes his discussion of Lack's work by stating that individual parents practice reproduction planning, but in the sense that they optimize their birth rates instead of restricting them for the good of the public. Battle of the Generations To explain the behavior of parent animals in caring for and rearing their young, Dawkins introduces the concept of parental investment, P.I., this is a clear concept that was first popularized by R.L. Trivers way back in 1972. This concept is defined as follows. Parental investment, or PI, is any investment by the parent animal in an offspring that significantly increases the offspring's chance of survival at the cost of the parent animal's ability to invest in another offspring. 
What this entails is that the PI is going to be measured based on the detriment it causes to the life expectancy of the parent's other children. It's also necessary to measure the detriment caused to the parent's nephews, nieces, and immediate relatives. Dawkins discusses the natural phenomenon of menopause among females in the context of parental investment. Women become gradually less effective in bearing children as they grow older. The direct effect of this is that the life expectancy of an offspring from an old mother is less than that of an offspring from a young mother. Dawkins also offers a possible explanation to the evolution of menopause in women. A female cannot fully invest in her grandchildren if she continues to have children of her own. Because of this, the genes that causes infertility in women grow and becomes numerous. These genes are passed down through the generations by the grandchildren, whose existence and survival were assisted by their grandmother's altruism. The battle of the generation refers to the unending conflicts between parents and their young. An offspring cheats by pretending to be hungrier than it really is. It uses psychological tactics to deceive its parents into feeding it more food. On the other hand, the parent works on becoming more alert in identifying the liars, cheaters, and pretenders among their offspring. If an offspring looks like a liar, the parent will feed it less. This conflict goes on until the time the parent weaned the offspring away from their nest or abode. This paints the picture that natural selection tends to favor offspring who know how to cheat and deceive. When you look at wild populations of animals, you can see that cheating and deception is quite common within families. Battle of the Sexes Dawkins goes into depth to explain the inherent conflicts that often occur between mates who are not related to each other. Since the mother and the father are both bent on improving the survival of their children, common sense dictates that there has to be some advantage if both of them cooperate in rearing the children. However, sexual relationships are often rife with mutual mistrust and mutual exploitation. Such mistrust and exploitation can occur even if both parents are looking over the welfare of the same offspring. For instance, conflicts occur if one parent invests fewer resources on offspring compared to the amount of resources that the other parent invested. An effect of this scenario is that the parent who invested less tends to be better off because it has additional resources it can invest in another mate. The battle of the sexes is a very complicated one, and Dawkins explains it in detail using examples, samples, and illustrations of what's actually happening in the animal world. He answers questions with regards to male-female ratios in wild animal populations, desertion and adoption tendencies in animals, cases of animal fidelity and domesticity, courtship rituals, copulation strategies, etc. Dawkins also discusses various types of breeding systems among animals. These would include harem systems, monogamy, and promiscuity. According to Dawkins, all of these can be understood only in terms of the inherent conflicts among males and females. An individual organism, whether it's a male or a female, will do almost anything to maximize its reproductive output during its lifetime. This race for reproductive survival is affected by several factors, like the size of the eggs and the number of the sperms. These fundamental differences give rise to biases among the males and females on how they treat each other or on how they care for their offspring. With everything that's been discussed, a biologist may be forced to think that he's observing a society wherein females compete for males instead of the other way around. However, this is disputed by the case of birds of paradise. The thinking goes that female birds of paradise don't look colorful and vibrant because they don't need to compete for males. Therefore, the males have to be the ones who are colorful and vibrant because they need to get the attention of the females. You scratch my back, I'll ride on yours. So far, Dawkins has extensively discussed parental, sexual, and aggressive interactions among survival animals that belong to the same species. Now, how about interactions of the same nature among animals of different species? For instance, zebras are often seen herding together with other animals like news in the plains of Africa or the fact that flocks composed of several species of birds are sometimes observed in the wild. With that in mind, Dawkins introduces the concept of reciprocal altruism, or what he refers to as the principle of, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. 
He asserts that if animals are to live together in organized groups, their genes must receive more benefits from the association compared to what they contribute to it. This is observable in hyenas, spiders, emperor penguins, and in certain species of fish and birds. A good example of reciprocal altruism is the alarm calls that birds do as a way of warning other birds of a potential predator. Dawkins says that this can be easily explained as the kin selection theory. If you don't buy the ideas behind the theory, there are other alternative theories you can consider. The point here is that a bird gains selfish benefits from warning its fellow birds. Dawkins offers two alternative theories to explain this. The first one is called the cave theory, and the second one is called the never break ranks theory. The cave theory is quite simple. When a bird realizes the presence of danger, it simply crouches on the ground, sits still, and then makes a quick hissing sound to warn other members of the flock. The bird does this purely from a selfish point of view. The quick warning to its companions is an advertent strategy for self-preservation. By warning the other birds, the lone bird reduces the chance that the predator will spot the flock and dive into the vicinity. This is why, according to Dawkins, this theory is most suitable to camouflage birds that crouch frozen near the ground when danger is imminent. On the other hand, the never break ranks theory is suitable for species of birds whose strategy of survival is to fly away when a predator is spotted. Let's say a lone bird spots a predator. What it does next is critical for its survival. If it tries to fly off on its own, it will become an odd bird and thus easier to be spotted by the predator. Therefore, what it does is utter a warning call so that all the other birds in the flock are aware of the presence of the predator. This whole flock will then fly away towards a tree for cover. Again, the bird that uttered the warning did it for selfish reasons. The bird did it for purely selfish advantage. This concept has been promulgated by other scientists such as J.R. Krebs and E.L. Charnoy. Dawkins provides other examples that expound further on these principles. There's the case of gazelles that go starting as a survival strategy in the presence of predators. It's previously believed that gazelles jump up and down to warn other gazelles of the imminent danger. However, it seems like this is not the case at all. Apparently, a gazelle jumps up and down to catch the attention of the predator. It's basically sending the message that it can jump so high, making the impression that the predator will be better off going after another gazelle that isn't as athletic. Needless to say, the gazelle isn't really altruistic when it stops in the presence of a predator. It's yet another case of selfish behavior to preserve itself. Dawkin further explains his theories by going deep into the practices and survival instincts of insects, particularly the kamikaze bees and certain species of ants. Based on the numerous examples and instances of reciprocal altruism in the wild, we can therefore expect it to have played an important role in the evolution of humans. For instance, it's quite possible that the large human brain evolved as a mechanism for more devious cheating and for better ability of identifying cheaters. Dawkins concludes that it's important that we apply the concept of reciprocal altruism to our own species to better understand how we may have evolved. Memes, the new replicators. Dawkins believes that the majority of the things that separate man from other living organisms all refer to culture. He uses the word culture with a scientist view in the sense that culture transmission is analogous to genetic transmission. This can actually give rise to some sort of evolution. However, he is quick to point out that cultural transmission is not really that unique to man. He cites the case of a certain species of bird called saddlebacks in New Zealand that can transmit songs to other birds via imitation and not through gene transference. For example, a saddleback bird can learn a new song or two from other birds in its territory. P.F. Jenkins, the scientist who studied and analyzed these birds, refers to this development of new songs as the process of cultural mutations. There are other prominent examples of cultural evolution in birds and monkeys. However, cultural evolution can be best observed in humans. Obvious examples of this cultural evolution within our species include language, fashion sense, ceremonies, customs, music, technology, engineering, art, and architecture. All of these have nothing to do with genetic evolution, although at times they look like they have genetic origins. Dawkins points out the common analogies between cultural evolution and genetic evolution. There's also the analogy between genetic evolution and scientific progress that has been promulgated by the likes of Karl Popper, J.M. Colon, F.T. Cloak, and L.L. Cavalli-Savorza. 
Dawkins provides an argument that for us to understand the extent of the evolution of man, we must start by throwing out the gene of the soul foundation of our principles on evolution. That's surprising because it's coming from an avid Darwinian like Dawkins. The author goes on to expound on why he thinks in this particular way with regards to human evolution. Genes are replicators, and Dawkins believes that there's already a new kind of replicator that's staring us right in the face. He calls the new replicator a meme, an abbreviation of the Greek word mameme, and pronounced in rhyme with cream. According to Dawkins, human culture is the new primeval soup and memes are the new replicators. The author rattles off a slew of meme examples such as tunes, catchphrases, and ways of making pots, ways of making building arches, ideas, and fashion trends. Just like genes, memes propagate and replicate themselves for survival. If genes jump from one body to another through eggs and sperm, memes transmit themselves by jumping from one human brain to another through the process of imitation. For example, if a scientist comes up with an idea, he spreads it around by writing papers, articles, and presentations about. As the idea transfers from the lone scientist's brain to other brains, it becomes a meme. The meme propagates itself from one brain to another almost as a strategy of survival. One colleague of Dawkins even goes so far as to say that memes should be regarded as living structures both technically and metamorphically. Selection tends to favor memes that have the capability to exploit their cultural environment for their own advantage. The cultural environment in question is composed of other memes. With that said, the meme slowly starts developing the attributes of what's considered to be an evolutionary stable set. Dokken concludes this chapter with the assertion that it may be possible for man to have the capacity for genuine, disinterested, true altruism. Even if we are to assume that every man is selfish, our consciousness can help us avoid the selfish excesses of unseeing replicators. We evolved as gene machines for millions of years, but we became cultured as meme machines. What makes us different from other organisms on Earth is that we have the power to rebel against our gene creators. In the words of Dawkins, we can turn against the dictatorship of the selfish replicators. Nice Guys Finish First Dawkins uses the popular gambling game called Prisoner's Dilemma to further expound on the concept of reciprocal altruism. A unique feature of the game is that there is no way of inserting trust. The game often ends in mutual defection, which is considerably poor outcome for both of the players. This is why a version of the game called Iterated or Repeated Prisoner's Dilemma has been introduced. It's like the older version of the game, but it's repeated in an indefinite number of times with the same set of players. In the old version, there exist only two strategies for the players. They can either defect or cooperate. In the new version, players have access to numerous other strategies. In fact, the strategies that we can use in the new version are only limited by our own ingenuity. The iterated prisoner's dilemma is not only common among human beings, the game is also easily observable in the animal world. It's even seen among plant organisms. Dawkins then delves into the myriad of strategies that are often associated with this hypothetical game. In a famous research experiment, the American political scientist Robert Axelrod collected strategies from experts in game theory in playing the iterated prisoner's dilemma game. Fourteen strategies were submitted, but Axelrod added a fifteenth strategy for good measure. Axelrod placed all 15 strategies in a single common programming language, then played them out against each other in a computer. Axelrod found that the winning strategies shared two common attributes, and these are niceness and forgivingness. The Long Reach of the Gene There's a paradox that exists if you're going to look at life using the two ways that were extensively discussed in this book. In several chapters, we looked at an individual organism as an entity that would do anything to maximize its ability to pass and replicate its genes. We looked at this organism as an intelligent being that's capable of weighing the genetic benefits of its actions. Yet, in other chapters of the book, we looked at life using the perspective of individual genes. Without this perspective, there's no reason why a survival machine would care about a reproductive efficiency either for itself or for its offspring and other relatives. Herein lies the paradox. Dawkins suggests that you read another book of his called The Extended Phenotype because he goes deeper in said book to explain and unravel the paradox we just mentioned. 
The way it is used in the scientific world, a phenotype is the bodily manifestation of a gene through development. For example, a particular gene can cause a phenotypic effect such as a blonde hair color. Among other organisms, a gene can have several phenotypic effects. In light of these observations, some genes are favored by evolution not because of their nature, but because of their phenotypic consequences. It's worth mentioning here, however, that a phenotypic effect can either benefit or penalize the existence of a survival machine as a whole. For instance, a gene may cause a phenotypic effect that's beneficial for itself, but it's harmful to other genes in the host body. A good example of this is the process called meiotic drive, which happens during meiosis. For a meiotic drive to occur, there should be the presence of what's called segregation distorters. These are basically mutant genes that appear during meiosis. What happens is that these mutant genes spread at the expense of the alleles. This process is called meiotic drive, and its effect on the body as a whole can be harmful or even disastrous. One of the most well-known segregation distorters is the T gene that can be found in the bodies of mice. If a mouse has a pair of these T genes, it will either die young or become completely sterile. However, not all segregation distorters have harmful effects. In a few instances, they can be good for the body as a whole. Dawkins uses the caddis fly and its ability to build a house at its larva stage as a prime example in explaining his theory of extended phenotypes. Genes in one survival machine can give rise to phenotypic effects on the body of another survival machine. Using snails and the evolution of their shells as an analogy, Dawkins takes the concepts and apply it on the caddis fly and how it evolved to develop the ability to build its own house during its larva stage. He demonstrates that the phenotypic effects of a single gene can be transferred not only to inorganic objects but to other living organisms as well. He uses other examples like crabs being parasitized by barnacles, snails being parasitized by flukes, and flower beetles being parasitized by protozoans. Dawkins also makes the suggestion that some living organisms are probably the product of ancient parasitic mergers. He makes this assertion considering the plethora of beneficial parasite-host relationships in the natural world. He uses as an example the case of the wood-boring ambrosia beetles, which serve as host to a certain type of bacteria. Both parties benefit from each other, which means that their genes are cooperating for both of their survival and propagation. According to Dawkins, this argument can also be applied to our own human genes. Our genes cooperate with each other because they share the same outlet into the future. In yet another extensive illustration of his extended phenotype principle. Dawkins uses as an example the young cuckoo bird, a cuckoo offspring that's yet in its nest apparently has the ability to either dupe or attract birds from other species to feed it. There are various theories on why or how this happens. One theory even suggests that the host birds are in some way addicted to the young cuckoo's red gape, in the same manner that a person is addicted to drugs or hooked on television programs. Essentially speaking, it's a case of manipulation. In the case of the cuckoo and other similar cases, natural selection has always favored the genes for manipulation. These genes for manipulation also have significant effects on the bodies of the manipulated organisms. In the early 1970s, nobody knew who Richard Dawkins was. Just like most biologists and zoologists of that time, he was busy doing extensive research in a laboratory. That changed almost overnight with the publication of the Selfish Gene in 1976. It was Dawkins' very first book, and in the eyes of most observers, it still remains as his best published book to date. The book was an international bestseller and went on to be translated into more than a dozen languages. Universities use it almost like a textbook. Students of evolutionary biology hold on to it like a Bible. Its lasting influence on the public's understanding of science is undeniable. Why? There are literally hundreds of books out there about evolutionary theory and natural selection. Why did the selfish gene become a bestseller while the rest of the pack languished in obscurity? What did it have that the other books didn't? There are two prime answers to such questions. One, Dawkins writes in a manner that's very appealing to the general population. He is a talented writer. And it really shines in the book's clear and direct prose. It also happens that he is an effective storyteller. 
In the hands of other writers, gene theories can sound rather boring and too complicated, but not Dawkins. Whether he's talking about molecules, replicators, or the primeval soup, he makes them interesting by interweaving their principles with eye-opening accounts as seen in the real world. The second reason why the selfish gene made a huge impact is that it took a really unique approach in explaining natural selection and the role of genes in the Darwinian theory of evolution. When writing about the theory of evolution, most scientific writers approach the topic in the perspective of organisms as a whole. Dawkins took this much deeper by tackling the topic in the perspective of the gene. The result is a different and brand new way of understanding the origin of life on Earth. Dawkins took an approach that has never been done before. He was way ahead of his time considering the fact that he wrote the book in the 1970s. In the book, Dawkins' main contention is that our genes created us and they continue to transform us to this day. Every organism on Earth exists from the preservation and propagation of these genes. In the words of the author, we're about survival machines for our selfish genes. Our genes can destroy us if they want to. This is why there's too much manipulation, devious deceit, exploitation, competition, and sheer brutality amongst our genes. Dawkins provides us with a clear understanding of the concepts, principles, and theories surrounding these genes' processes. In a nutshell, the selfish gene is a must-read for anyone interested in learning about evolutionary theory, natural selection, and the origin of life in general. It's concise, not too academic, and most importantly, its ideas remain very important to this day. Whether you are a student, a scientific expert, or a mere layman, you will find something interesting and valuable in this book.